All righty. Well, it is now 5.01. I'll keep admitting people as we go, or I see that they're in the waiting room, but I will go ahead and get this kicked off. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for choosing to attend. Um, this is a quick, hope about an hour-long presentation on understanding why veterans make good project managers, and then also the understanding value of and what are professional certifications, as well as talking through then various funding resources available to veterans while they're in uniform or beyond in terms of upskilling yourself and getting certified. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so my name is Josh Agatson. I'm a Marine Corps veteran by background. I did two combat deployments, uh, one with NATO and one with SOCOM. I'll go through my own journey into project management you know, a little bit later on. It's gonna describe where my journey started and why I'm so passionate about this topic. I'm now the Chief Strategy Officer with PM ProLearn, right? We're a project management training company, and I'm a brand ambassador with a company called Salute to Suit. If you are looking for a professional wardrobe in transition, I highly recommend you check them out. Uh, it's nice having someone who can answer all those questions about how do you dress like a professional when you no longer live at home. So, all right. The agenda part one, we're going to talk about what is project management, right? Why veterans make good project managers and overlap the military planning and leadership cycle to project management as a concept. In the second half, we're gonna talk about understanding certifications in general. What are they, how do you get them and how do they help you in the job search? All right, so if the most effective weapon on the battle space is a thinking service member and their weapon, what are we doing to improve thought and empower decision-making, right? It's kind of the genesis Thank of you. our corporate strategy and our passion going forward. All right, the peer fight right now requires empowered thinking decision makers, right, at the point of need, right, small teams in rapid change, and project management training actually reinforces everything that the current services are going after in terms of strategy in the peer environment. Okay, so multi-domain operations onto the Army side of the house. For the Army folks out there, right, our enemies are fielding mutually supporting systems designed to be effective against well-understood patterns. How do we vary that up overall, right? The tenets of multi-domain operations, the X's down below show you the areas specifically augmented or supported by the skills of project management, right? Independent maneuver, human potential, cross-domain synergy, and then mission command, right, as a foundation. Okay, for the Marines and Navy folks, EABO, DMO, and Loki, right? How do we apply critical thought, innovate smartly, and adapt to complex environments, right? Down on the bottom, Success is defined by fielding the smallest, lowest signature, most lethal team possible, okay? AFDP1 for my airmen that are out there, right? We have to give airmen leeway without being prescriptive to adapt to the environment they're a part of and empower them to make decisions for the most part, right? Leaders must push decision-making to the lowest capable component, right? There's a cultural rift that's been developed where we want to CYA and make decisions at the top rather than trying to push this down as low as possible, okay? Again, I'll talk to you why project management thrives and complements this concept, okay? So the skills of project management transcend military to civilian and apply to every job you are ever going to have. So throughout the presentation tonight, I'm going to be inviting you to interact with me a little bit, and this is kind of the first part, right? What job or MOS do you think would benefit from these skills? You know, try not to volunteer people or call on them, but that's how participation works. So come off mute, put it in the chat if you'd like. However we choose to communicate is up to you all, just so we can start collaborating together. Hey, Josh, this is Rich. I'm going to go with uh, all of the above. <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> D, all the above. No, I think you're right, right? I mean, I didn't know what project management was, but as I learned about this, I started seeing that, hey, this really transcends everything, right? Even if your title is not project manager, you're not the one responsible for it, understanding how to do these things and integrate these components makes you a better teammate, right, into every job you're gonna have. So it's not about rank, it's not about an MOS, it's really about skills of leadership, planning, and execution. Okay, so my own journey into project management give you where I started, right? I started in Lean Six Sigma as a maintenance officer in the Marine Corps. Uh, the first execution I had in that was phase mode for the Marines that are out there. It's the premier maintenance inspection. I was able to use the skills to improve equipment readiness and ultimately pass that inspection, okay? I then deployed in human intelligence 
with SOCOM and I got certified from Bagram actually rerouting our supply chain and our awarding process to take it from 180 days you know, for Bronze Star down to less than seven, okay? So I saw the effectiveness of Lean Six in uniform. I then got exposed to PMP as a transition concept as a division plans officer. And we started changing the way we worked inside of the G4 by applying the tenets of project management. I then left the military, I got into construction, right? I was successful there. I got into government consulting. I saw it used there. Then I eventually became an entrepreneur. And I've still used a lot of those same skill sets in every step of the way, regardless of the job title, right? Kind of back to the previous slide of all the above. Okay, so what is a project, right? Everyone's been told veterans are project managers. Hopefully at the end of this, you're gonna understand exactly why they say that, okay? But a project is a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result, right? It's a mission, okay? The project manager is the action officer, individual responsible for accomplishing that task, right? Accomplishing that mission. Okay, so how do you do it, right? Project management is the application of knowledge, skills, and abilities to accomplish a mission, right? And it follows a five-step process. Initiate, plan, execute, monitor, control, and close, right? It's gonna look very similar to the military planning process in the end. A successful project is one that's done in scope, on time, within resources and budgets, and satisfies commander's intent or the customer. Okay, I'm gonna intentionally weave in some military jargon with this so you start seeing the overlap as we go. All right, key skills needed and taught. Every project, like a mission, requires you to pull from a toolbox of capability to design the plan based on the desired outcome. Okay, your ability to lead, think, build a plan in the team is essential. The ability to track work and monitor what you're doing is also critical, but it really comes down to how effectively you can lead, grow your team, and execute that mission plan. All right? Okay, there are three main types of projects. Right, the predictive project on the left-hand side started in construction. That's the foundation of the PMP. Okay, predictive meaning that I know exactly what's supposed to happen and my job is to execute as closely as possible, okay? The adaptive side started in software, okay, or IT. This doesn't mean that either of those stay only applicable to those realms, but it was essentially change-driven projects. And in the middle, you have Lean Six Sigma or process efficiency and quality improvement type projects, right? We're gonna go through this and outline how all these things link together here in a minute. Okay, there's a thing called the triple constraint in a project or scope, cost, and schedule. Okay, in a traditional project or the predictive project, the mission is fixed, right? The scope is fixed. I have a clearly defined objective, and I'm going to then build a detailed plan and a detailed schedule based on the desired intent of that scope, right, or the mission set. My effectiveness as a leader is how well I can first plan, but then also manage and utilize those resources to ideally come in faster and with less cost, right, or less resource requirement. If I can do that and still equal high quality, that increases profitability overall, right? Companies in the civilian world like that. Even in logistics, if I'm able to save resources, i.e. ammo, chow, water, right, things like that, that means I can employ those resources more effectively into the battle space to then accomplish more mission if possible. Okay, on the right-hand side of the screen, you see the adaptive project, okay? Unlike traditional projects where the scope is fixed, an adaptive project, my resources and my schedule are fixed. And my success in that environment is how well I can use what I have to accomplish as much mission as possible. Okay, so in that world, think of some of your squads, right? Your smaller teams, right? I've only got what I carried into the fight and my effectiveness is how well I can use what I brought with me to accomplish as much of the mission as possible. I may or may not even have the authority to ask for more stuff and maybe beyond my positional control to influence those decisions. So I have to learn how to use and maximize everything that I've got in my fingertips, okay? If you look at another perspective, right? Strategic, operational, and tactical, you'll see that the strategic end falls more into the predictive world. And that makes sense, right? Because our O plans and big missions have to stay fairly consistent. Otherwise the individuals are getting whipped around on the bottom end for change, okay? In the adaptive world that falls purely into the tactical realm for the most part, because Again, it's dealing with smaller teams and affecting as much mission as possible. Now, the operational world is where you see these things start merging together, okay? Because sometimes I need plans to stay more predictive. Other times I need them to change and adapt, all right? In the terms of certifications, right? The PMP falls into the strategic to operational lens. Lean Six Sigma transcends them all. And then ACP or Agile Certified Practitioner fits more into that operational to tactical environment. Okay, if you think about it in terms of change, predictive change is bad, adaptive change 
is good, right? Think back to the construction. If I've already built the foundation and the customer says, I'd like to add on a new room, we can do that, but that's very expensive and very costly and requires a lot of additional work, okay? And an adaptive end, right? The customer doesn't really know what they want. They want change all the time. So I need to be as fluid and flexible as possible so I can always be changing based on the environment that I work in. Okay, another way to look at this, the left-hand side of the screen is your senior level commands. The right-hand side of the screen would be the individual service member, okay? The more large the command is, the bigger the command is, the more predictive it is, the smaller the unit, the more adaptive it can be, okay? Now, various certifications and learning fit across that entire model, but if I could stick a big green blob called staff work or IPT work, then I think you really also get an inherently agile environment where we need the staff to be able to change based on everything they're experiencing overall. And having worked on multiple IPTs, I've used agile almost on a daily basis. All right, so the no project in its entire, is entirely predictive or adaptive and the integration of methodologies allows you to build the right plan for the right mission, okay? Just like the military, nothing's ever all of one or the other. So I need to be able to know when to pull from what tools and resources based on what's in front of me. Okay, so we talked about the civilian process earlier, right? Initiate, plan, execute, monitor, control, and close. The right-hand side, you see the military process, right? With PP, MDMP, JPP, whatever you wanna use, this is a very close proximity to all of them. Okay, so commander's intent, right? co dev co-war gaming, comparison decision, write the order, right? On structure, on paper, they look extremely similar. But if you look closer, you realize that the military process kind of stops at phase two, which is writing the plan, okay? Success as a PM is not just writing a detailed plan, but actually executing that plan and monitoring what happens throughout the execution of that entire plan to ensure success, right? We talked about the scope being fixed, but I have to know where my consumption rates are in terms of equipment or resources or expertise, as well as schedule relative to delivery, because that's all right, Jerry. Um, we have to know what's going on, right? And in the civilian world, labor is the most expensive thing you're ever gonna manage. Okay, in the military, we often discard cost of labor and someone working the weekend. But as a civilian, right, not knowing where my labor is and how things are gonna happen drives up cost exponentially. All right, if you look at the civilian cycle, again, for project management, right, monitor and control really encompasses every aspect of your project and the plan. This is where military starts to thrive, right? The ability to lead and engage and, and be a part of the team in the development cycle from the beginning to end is something we do all the time. The management side is something where we lack. And I think in the military, we see management and leadership as opposing concepts, but they're not, right? You manage stuff and you lead people, but in a project, you have to do both, right? You have to lead your team, but you also have to manage all the resources necessary for the execution of that project. And I think building on and teaching some of that would allow us to be more effective in uniform and then also more effective on the outside. Um, logisticians manage all the time because we have to in terms of ordering reorder points and consumption rates and plans to make sure that the fight can continue. But outside, I think of supply and logistics, management in terms of mission execution is not done as well. All right, so what about agile, right? Change is good. Okay, we talked about it a little bit, but at its core, it's about integrating and embracing change through iterative and incremental delivery, All right? Rather than biting off the whole whale at once, we do it one bite at a time. By breaking projects down into smaller pieces, we allow for the identification of change and allow for new ideas and feedback. Okay, in agile projects, change is expected and the means of solving the mission are unclear, right? So agile fits great where I have a good idea and intent, but I'm really not sure what to do about it or how to do it. Okay, agile focuses on empowering the team to solve the problems and integrate new ideas within a known construct that still tracks mission progress, right? It's not chaos, it's controlled chaos, but it actually empowers everyone to be a participant in your mission. Okay, where does it fit, right? Co-adev cycle is inherently agile. Okay, throw it on the wall, see what sticks. Doesn't work, go back, rewrite the plan, show it back to the commander again. We go through this iterative process every couple of weeks until we finally slap the table on the COA that's most desired. Then we shift into a predictive planning cycle. Okay, again, why I said staff work is inherently agile. Okay, the other place it fits in the military, and this is our passion as a company, is small unit leadership, right? An agile team is 12 or less, right? Give me a structure in the military of 12 or less that is a consistent structure. All right, open to you all. ODA, squad. All right, perfect. What else? Okay. 
Well, what Intel teams? Planning teams, maintenance teams, tank crew. Okay, there's a lot of team structures that are small and their mission is always changing. Okay. Maintenance section. All right, so Agile fits great as a small unit leadership concept, right? And every E4 and above could be certified in this while they're in uniform. Okay. But for Agile to work, it's not process driven. I mean, a lot of people think we're just going to do Agile, right? The military, the DOD as a framework says we're Agile now, we're doing Agile, right? Agile isn't a do, Agile is a be concept, right? For Agile to work, it's culture-based. So for an Agile team, everyone has equal value to contribute. Everyone has to feel like they're a part of that team. Information has to be shared freely, up and down, good and bad, okay? No one's beyond improvement or recommendation, right? There's no rank on an Agile team because if there is, then people aren't gonna give you the feedback necessary to adapt to the environment you're working in. I saw this on the ODA teams when I was with SOCOM, right? I also saw this in aviation in the debrief, right? because the team obviously matters more and the goal is to everyone improves, okay? A leader's job is to serve their team, right? Remove barriers from success, right? It goes back to servant leadership and mission command, okay? And then the team matters more. It's ultimately all about the team and the collective performance, not any one individual. All right, so a way to look at predictive and adaptive, they call it waterfall or agile is two concepts, right? In a waterfall model, I know that I want the car. So now I build a manufacturing model to build exactly what I want. Okay, in an agile concept, I want the means to improve mobility. I'm not sure how I'm going to get there. So maybe the first idea is a skateboard. And then we decide that it's not stable enough. So I put a pole on it and I call it a scooter because I need something a little more stable. But then I realize I'm not going fast enough. It's not quite the mechanical advantage that I wanted. So now I build it into a bike. And then after I test that for a little bit, I realize. It's still not good enough, so I add a motor onto it. And then maybe after I build it as a motorcycle, I realize it doesn't carry enough stuff, so I'm still not getting what I want. Now I finally build it into a car. So I iterate the design and development, like rdt &E and test and evaluation go through iterative cycles, right? It's taking that same kind of approach to how we execute missions and allow our team to keep modifying what they're doing based on what they see in front of them. It's not about IT or software. Okay, so another way to participate, right, is this a project. Okay, go ahead and come off mute or put it in chat. Just start showing and using things you guys already know. Conducting a field exercise. Is that a project? Oh, planning or preparing for maintenance inspection. Planning for conducting a deployment. Yes to all. There's actually a catch in this one. It's not a yes to all. Sorry, you can't just do your way out on this. Implementing a new process. Right. Changing SOPs or TTPs, right? Conducting an operation. Planning for readiness inspection. Implementing a new piece of technology or software. Performing maintenance. Developing a training plan or curriculum. Everything on this list but performing maintenance would be considered a project. Okay, the daily act of doing maintenance is called operational work. However, if I'm leading a team that is doing maintenance to improve readiness, then that effort becomes the project that I have, right? That's the temporary and unique objective where I've designed a plan and I'm leading my team to solve it overall. Okay, I'm guessing almost every one of these, all of you have done to some capacity or not, right? When I do the application course that I'm doing actually in a couple of weeks on how to fill out the PMP application. I use building a house in a foreign country as a model to kind of show you exactly why deployments look like projects, but they're identical, okay? All right, understanding the various certifications that we've talked about, right? If you guys are interested in pursuing them, 
right? Agile Certified Practitioner is on small teams in rapid change, which we talked about. It's a three-day course, requires 21 hours of training, 12 months of general project experience, and eight months of change-driven projects, right? I talked about E5 earlier this week, working through his application, right? Didn't understand, like, wow, I really have a lot of stuff I can use to get certified in that, okay? It's recommended on our end for any E4, E5, and above, because it really builds on that servant leadership mission command model. Okay, Lean Six Sigma is on efficiency and quality, process flow, value. It's a 35-hour course for our program, but there's a lot of different trainers out there. And Lean Six isn't really regulated like PMI certifications are. So make sure you find a good trainer if you want to do it. I got Lean from a community college. I think there's a lot of great ways to get it if you want it. There is no experience requirement, but from an understanding standpoint, I'd say probably any E5, E6, and above. And then PMP is the third iteration, right? It covers multiple levels of projects, but uh, it's a 35-hour course, requires five years of experience if you don't have a college degree, or three years of experience if you do have a college degree. So again, that's what we're looking at, that E6 and above. I've had some E5s and E4s with master's degrees go through and get certified. That's not a catch-all, but if you're purely using military experience, I'd look at anyone with about five plus years in uniform. All right, what ranks qualify to get certified? I've covered some of this, but here's a graphical depiction of it, right? CAPM, where the certified associates in project management requires zero experience whatsoever, if you wanted. Um, Rich, I'll talk about CCMP in a minute. Um, I actually like it, but it, finding a trainer's hard. So CAPM could start at any rank. It's meant for like high school graduates, right? Agile, like I said, E3 to E4, Lean 6, E4 to E5, and then PMP by, you know, E6 and above. Now you could again pull that PMP down a little bit to right at the E5, E6 barrier, I think would be a good starting point. This is built for you know, Marines and Navy who don't have access to other benefits in education. I put this one together for the Army just because they have a program called Army Ignited. It's a great resource and you actually have three to four more days to submit for FY22 to cover all these certifications if you wanted. Um, scan the QR code in the corner and I can talk you through what that means like in a minute. And then Air Force Cool for Airmen, right? We found a way to get everybody through to PMP, actually using CAPM as the career goal. And then we upgrade the exam afterwards when your application gets approved. But Airmen have $4,500 over their career for enlisted Airmen to use as benefits. All right, so we talked before about this being a leadership toolbox, okay? All these certification courses complement one another. Okay, Lean is taught in Agile as an efficiency concept, right? You're going to learn Lean and Kaizen and Kanban in an Agile training program. Lean Six Sigma is in of itself a project, but it doesn't teach you how to run projects. It's about process efficiency and increasing quality, but the implementation of those changes you make starts falling more into traditional project management. Okay, and then PMP, Six Sigma is taught in PMP as a quality system and half the PMP exam is agile based. So they really do all mesh together. Now, you know, Richard, for your thought on change management, right? When you go through a change management course, depending on who you go through, I went through ProSci, but if you put a circle around all of these called change management, right, that really encompasses all of it because change management is focused on the human speed of adoption. It's not talking so much about project change as it is getting buy-in from a audience so that when I execute the physical part of change, they knew it was coming, they knew it's expected out of them. So when change arrives, they're already running within that new cycle, that new program, right? The military is the one organization that can do change horribly wrong, but nobody gets to quit. Right? You're going to execute orders anyway, whether you like it or not, whether people enjoy it or not. But I think recruiting and retention is starting to see what happens when change policy goes bad and no one considers the respect of the employee, right? Like COVID policies and other things where people go, look, I don't like that. I mean, the Air Force just pushed out a message that E6 promotion is only 16% this year. It's like, well, if you put the message out ahead of time and people knew that it was coming, when that bad news comes, there's a less of an emotional reaction to it because I was informed and aware of this change before you decided to make the change. And if you can, gain buy-in and feedback through town halls and other mechanisms so that you can incorporate the feedback of your team before you action a change. Change management as an industry has about 180,000 jobs out there as a profession. I think it's a great field to go into. And if I wasn't doing what I'm doing right now, I'd probably be a change manager because I love the field of change management. So Richard, did I ask your question on CCMP? Yeah, dude, I'll, I'll probably shoot you a link or, or shoot you an email, you know, a little bit later tomorrow to, to get a little bit more for information. Interesting pro side, but the uh, 
you know, Army Ignited and uh, I'm not sure about Air Force Cool, but they, you know, finding a vendor is really difficult. Yeah, there's actually no one approved in Army Ignited to teach CCMP, but I've yeah, got something to connect you with that can help you who are who have gotten the certification already. Okay, yeah, please. All right, when you look at active duty mission sets and where it fits, right, your targeting cycle, Intel operations fit very well in Agile. We talked about the small unit leadership aspect and implementation of it, right? Distribution, logistics, maintenance, and admin fit well under Lean Six Sigma. And then PMP is more the strategic planning in as well. These are just some ideas of what might fall into where you'd use these certifications. All right, things you learn in project management not tied by the military. So if I were to ask you all, who is a stakeholder in your environment, what would you say? Right, give me the first thought of I say, give me a stakeholder in your world. Who is it? Soldiers, okay. Commander. Commander. End user. Okay, who else? Anyone with buy-in? That's a good thought. Family. Your family. <laughs> They are definitely stakeholders. They just don't get a vote most of the time with the military. All right, so when I was active duty, I always saw stakeholders as those who outranked me that could make my life miserable, right? Because I had some toxic leaders, so we always managed up the chain really closely, okay? Um, that was kind of the most important stakeholder that we dealt with. But in a project speak, right, a stakeholder is anyone who is directly influenced by, perceived to be influenced by, or might be influenced by my mission, right? So like earlier, you know, D, all the above, right? Almost everybody that touches your project or mission is a stakeholder, okay? Now each person has some relative level of interest and influence on your mission set. And you have to understand those two dynamics in order to understand how to communicate with them and manage them. But everyone from the O10 to the E1 is a stakeholder, the adjacent supporting units and the local populace. So knowing the role that all of those people play relative to your mission allows you to better understand how to message those people. And that goes to my other product communications planning, right? I was taught Annex K. So log stats go on TAC 2 and operational stuff goes on TAC 1. And that's all we really learned about communications, right? How to functionally communicate. Yet communications in a project term is really more about IO or MILDEC, right? How do I send the right message via the right medium with the right amount of frequency to make sure that everyone on my project is aware of and influenced into what I need them to be doing? Okay, and understanding that concept allows you to then pull from the right partners on active duty to build those messaging campaigns to make sure that everyone knows what's happening in their battle space and what you expect of them to do. Okay, earned value management, we talked about that a little bit earlier, plan versus actual performance. Okay, conflict resolution, right? There are five levels of conflict and knowing what role you play inside of your team as a coach and a mentor to either enable conflict so the team can grow on their own or step in and stop conflict because it's about to go nuclear and there's going to be no survivors at the end, right? So knowing what role you play and how to play it is a great asset in military leadership. Okay, change management. If I embrace this new change, what does it do to my original baseline plan? Okay, agile framework and then team empowerment, how to fail fast, right? Failing fast is an agile concept where I want people to try it, test it, see it, do it, learn it in a controlled environment before I go live or we go into that peer competitive space where now I never had a chance to fail before and I'm alone and I can't talk to anybody, right? So we create that zero defect or remove the zero defect by allowing our teams to take risks in a controlled environment and fail early before we go execute later on. All right, what veterans bring to a project team, right? Plan, estimate, resources, organize teams, right? Leadership, mission focus, adaptability, handling stress, okay? No plan survives first contact and that's always true even in a project. So knowing that that happens and what to do about it and being able to adapt is key. All right, difference between military and civilian, right? Project failure in the military usually has minimal consequences outside of death, right? Someone gets hurt, someone goes catastrophic, then there's consequences. But in procurement, right, the Joint Strike Fighter is about a trillion dollars over budget. I don't think anyone's been fired, right? For the most part. So most projects that take too long, take too many days, nobody really has a catastrophic consequence. But as civilian side, Right, if I take too much time, consume too many resources, don't satisfy my customer, ultimately I'm gonna stop having a business or stop having a job because businesses exist to satisfy customers and make money, right? And if I can't do either of those things, then my business stops existing. Okay, ways to pay for certifications, right? 
Army Igniter, Army CA funding is a tremendous resource for every soldier active guard and reserve. There's no ADSO for officers anymore. They have 4K every single year that replenishes and pays for now 1,671 certifications, right? But just because a certification can be funded doesn't mean there's a trainer that teaches it like CCMP, which we talked about earlier. So it's a great resource and it happens all the time. Air Force Cool, $4,500 over the life of your career for enlisted airmen. Unit training funds, right? I use unit training funds to get Lean Six and PMP funded by the Marine Corps. So I can coach you through all these things too if you guys have questions. All right, the GI Bill. Right now, the GI Bill changed to pay for certification training and the test. I know for us, we're the only PMP approved GI Bill trainer in existence as well, but that's another resource for Title 31, 33, and 35 GI Bill. Onward to Opportunity, right? Another great program out there if you're 18 or six months out from transition and beyond for spouses and service members, right? Tuition reimbursement for civilian companies and then veteran discounts as well. Always ask for those. We give a 30% discount for veterans paying out of pocket. All right, if you wanted to join a class of ours, again, it's not why I'm doing this, but scan the QR code, let me know. We'll send you an invoice for soldiers you have until the 31st of July to use Army CA funding. Okay, you don't have to pass the test. You just have to finish the training program. We include the test and retest underneath the cost of training. So there's really no risk for you or any of your team members if you wanted to get it done. If you want us to come to you, you say, find it, pick a date, send us names. We need eight people to go anywhere in the world, right? So we're trying to make our training accessible to everyone at any location, um, simply by group scheduling. And then again, contact me if you want more info on the programs. Okay, first scrap back a long time ago, but every rank and every one of the military is doing projects, is trying to make sure veterans know that this skill set is something you already have. All right, any questions right now? I'm about to shift then going into what are professional certifications as a concept and how they apply to getting a job in transition. Anyone? All right, round two. All right, understanding certifications called marketability versus value or attractiveness versus character. So what are certifications? Okay, I didn't really think of this much, but we actually use certifying and certifications even in the military, like going to the rifle range. Right. Certifications are awarded by a professional organization that validates that you have the knowledge, skills, and credibility to do a job. Okay. Most of the people we want to hire, like doctors, lawyers, dentists, or even construction workers, usually come licensed or certified to do their job. Right. We're given a license as well to operate a vehicle. So licenses and certifications end up being pretty similar. Okay. Certifications involve meeting some standard and usually passing some test. Okay. Employers sometimes require you to be certified before they'll hire you or before you can get a raise, okay? Some companies value them, some companies don't. We're gonna talk about that here in a minute. Okay, there are three common terms that people hear, right? Certification, certificate, and a license, right? A lot of people are going for certificates, right? Colleges have master certificates in project management or master certificate in leadership. Okay, those are simply awarded because you sat through school. Okay, they don't carry the same weight as a certification or a license, right? Licenses and certifications are usually just awarded by different bodies. Okay, a license is usually given by a state, right, or a city or a governmental organization, and certifications are given by a governing body or a, a quality standard from a company, right? So they're awarded by different people, but the processes are pretty similar to get them. Okay, what it takes to be certified. Okay, I'm using project management as the example, but this applies to many certifications. Okay, normally three things, right, with or without a degree, you need some level of knowledge or learning, some minimum hours of training before you can apply for the exam. And you have to demonstrate some years of experience in a profession. We talked about project management, right? 36 to 60 months or 12 and eight for agile. Then there's an ability or a check, right? Some test for PMP, it's a closed book proctored test. It's four hours long, it's 180 questions, right? For agile, it's a three hour exam and 120 questions, but they're there so you can't cheat. Right, they're there to make sure that the certification maintains its quality and its value by earning it. Okay, and then there's a maintenance process, right? Most people wanna stay away from this. However, if I had a pilot, say get his license to fly a plane and he hasn't flown in a number of years and done nothing with it, I probably wanna make sure that he has maintained that qualification to be able to use it. So same thing, like the rifle range. If you shot a rifle in two or three years, you have to go back to the range to recertify before you can go forward and use your weapon. We do this with units, right? You haven't deployed together. You haven't trained together. I'm going to certify you as a unit before I let you go forward 
to do your job. If I've been in a B billet, I have to come back and kind of go back to school again before I'm able to be you know, released to do my job on my own. Okay, industry is the same way. It's just about maintaining relevance in your profession before you are considered a professional. CA pays for all of those fees too while in uniform. So there's no need to wait until you're in retirement before you start pursuing certifications if you are a soldier, okay? Tangible values of certifications. On average, certified professionals make 20 plus percent more than non-certified professionals. Again, that doesn't guarantee it at every job, but on average, you make more as a certified professional. Some jobs require you to have them to even be considered, right? Talking to a command sergeant major from seventh group, he said, I had a job I wanted. I was talking to a recruiter. It was over 200,000 a year. And they asked if I was a PMP and because I didn't have it, I couldn't even apply. Okay, so does that happen to everyone? No, but I'll tell you the first job that hired me didn't care that I was certified. My customers did. I found that if I went to work for my customers, I could have doubled my salary simply because I was a PMP that would have allowed me to apply for the position and be competitive and hire. Okay, so again, knowing the job you want lets you assess what cert to get. Intangible value, right? There's relatability with other professionals. If you speak that language and have been through that shared painful experience and you know somebody else has too, you can talk to them about it. It's a way to relate and connect. It's like going through tough schools in the military. Okay, it demonstrates capability to the civilian world, right? And it bridges that false perception divide. 1% of the population are veterans and most of what civilians know about the military comes from Hollywood. So thank you, Top Gun. Everyone's a flyboy now, right? Or Hurt Locker, you know, pick the movie that somebody may have seen. Their perception of what a veteran is may come from that viewpoint of Hollywood only. So showing up as a certified professional, speaking professional language, and being able to apply what you've done changes the conversation in an interview as you're going forward, okay? Um, confidence for yourself in an interview, right? I remember walking in being asked, why should I consider you for project manager? And I'll tell you, being certified made that response pretty easy. It wasn't guessing and hoping I could say the right words. It was, I know the words to say, and I'm a certified professional, okay? Um, industry terminology and standards. Again, if I'm gonna hire somebody and I can't talk to them in a language that I expect them to talk to me in, Right? That's a risk for me as a buyer, right? And in the job interview process or job searching process, you are a company selling your goods yourself to another company, okay? So it's about a sales pitch. If I can't talk to that customer, then I'm a higher risk proposition to buy the product from, okay? Knowing how to speak to them changes the dynamic. Broad application, cert dependent. We talked earlier about the skills of project management and many companies actually value them more than formal learning. Okay, why? Formal learning takes months to redo a curriculum to get it accredited. Certifications take weeks to modify content and curriculum. So again, any companies value them because they maintain relevance faster. The other reason any companies value them is that there is no TNR manual in a company, right? There's no guarantee that you've gone through a progression like the military where I know that when you show up with this, you bring all this capability to the table. Showing up where someone else has validated that capability for them makes it less risky for them and they know they don't have to invest in training for you to the same degree. All right, why pursue a certification in uniform? Okay, a lot of these skills of industry overlap with your current job, right? You can become more effective now rather than waiting until later. Okay, military training provides a foundation and your experience often qualifies you for the application process, which we talked about in project management, everything in the military qualifies as experience. Okay, some certifications can be loaded to your ORB or ERB and actually help with promotion. Okay, it's a chance to experience industries, right? So if you're curious about an industry, go take a course in it, right? Use your CA funding for your soldiers and try it out. If you go through that training program and hate every minute of it, you probably don't want to pursue a job in that industry. Okay, every soldier has 4K per year, right? It's use or lose. A lot of companies want to see post-certification experience, right? And there's a flood of people getting certified their last day in uniform. Some companies actually have a must-have cert plus so many years application to be considered for some of the senior level jobs. So getting it earlier helps you build that credibility before the interview. All right, why pursue a certification in transition? Okay, there's three reasons I can think of. Number one, the company I want to work for says I have to have it, right? It's the easiest reason and justification to get certified. Okay, number two, the jobs I keep seeing, these certifications pop up over and over again, okay? If that's the case, start looking into those. Number three, I want to learn what it's going to teach me. I talked to a vet today pursuing DevOps because he's got a construction background. He just wants to learn. It's a great way to pursue certifications, right? He doesn't have a job in mind. He just wants to broaden his capability set. There's credibility. 
Okay, but do your research, see what the jobs are asking for, and then base it on that or what you want to learn. Okay, a graphic that may help. Okay, the closer you get to transition, the more you need to be going after reason number one or number two. Okay, the farther you are from transition, the more you have the freedom to simply explore and try out new options. Okay, and then at the end, try to use SkillBridge as that experiential part to build your credibility. But even in SkillBridge, it's simply an interview at the end. If you are not credible at the end of that, you may still not get the job. So showing up to a SkillBridge certified in the industry increases your chance to have a better SkillBridge experience and also increases your chance of being hired at the end of your SkillBridge. Okay, if you're curious on marketability, go take a look, right? Type your certification into LinkedIn and see what pops up. This is a couple months old, but I typed PMP into LinkedIn in the US and there's almost 500,000 jobs. Okay, I typed Agile into LinkedIn to search. There's almost 700,000 jobs. Okay, again, Agile has a few other flavors, but ACP is the only Army CA or Air Force pool approved certification that gets free funding. So again, there's Scrum Master, there's Scale Agile Framework, there's a few others in the Agile world, but it depends on, is there funding available? And then it depends on the job you want. But Agile, the thing I like with ACP is it actually teaches you Scrum, Lean, Extreme Programming, and five other Agile methodologies at the same time, okay? Lean and Six Sigma, right? Some want knowledge of it. If you're going for process improvement, then you look at the green belt or the black belt process, depending on the job you want to have. And again, change management, I just typed that in. It says there's 480,000 jobs that were out there for change management at the time when I looked. And CCMP is a cert. Even ProSci isn't as marketable. However, the field of change management has a lot of jobs out there. And a lot of those are still looking for project management background. Okay, not all certs are the same. I think there's a trend right now to go for the easy lifetime guarantee certs, right? Companies don't respect them because they're easy to get, like a participation trophy. It's like, we don't respect the Army Achievement Medal, right? We respect badges and tabs that require discipline and effort to earn, right? Industry is the same way, right? The giveaway certs, you probably are not going to see listed as required on a job. Okay, so just do your research. All right, marketability versus value. Something I talk with vets a lot about. Okay, marketability, I look as attractiveness or my ability to be found by other companies who are looking. Okay, some certs might make you more attractive okay, or being shiny. Right, in a fishing analogy, your resume is the bait or your LinkedIn profile is the bait. The more shiny stuff you put on it, the more attractive you can become. Okay? But there's no guarantee that anyone is looking for that necessarily, right? The value, the character you build is the skills you take with you to every job you're ever going to have. Okay? That is something that no one can ever take away. But there's no guarantee, just like in dating or trying to attract somebody, that you can become attractive to everyone. All right? But your character is yours, right? Your skills and your value are yours. Know what you bring to the table. Identify what's important to that employer and then communicate that message effectively through your resume or through what I call hunting, which is another class I give called the Empowered Transition. I'll be giving again in another couple of weeks, but understanding how to use LinkedIn to identify veterans at an organization to influence the hiring manager on why you are value added as well. All right, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? We kind of talked about this a little bit, but you know, do things that make you marketable drive up your earning potential in an organization, right? Back to value versus character. Answer is, it depends, right? It depends on the company. Some companies care, some companies don't. And each company gets to determine their own value for what they're looking for, just like, again, dating. Okay, not every company will value certs the same way. Honestly, I said my first job didn't. I was certified in Lean Six and PMP as a master logistician and division planner. I was hired with a five-year air defense captain who had nothing. Okay, they did not care about the certs that I had. They didn't care about the experience that I brought to the table. They cared that I was a veteran. Right? They were simply hiring vets and they entered the same pipeline. I learned my customers really cared. And I also learned lots of other companies that would have cared. And I undersold my value because I really didn't know what I was for. Okay. Know what you bring to the table and know what your requirements are. I mean, it's a ping on another class that I give right, called the Empowered Transition of mapping your own life requirements to jobs and then assessing if it's the right fit for you. All right, getting hired is a business transaction. Okay? Your resume is a business proposal to the company and their job description is a request, right? Or a solicitation. You have to understand the business transaction. What's important to that company? What are they looking for? What gaps do they have and what are they trying to fill? 
Okay, so in that response, what's more compelling? Hire someone who's uncertified with no past performance or someone who's certified with years of past performance. Okay, set yourself up to be that I'm a certified professional with years of experience. That changes the conversation in an interview, right? It changes your marketability and your value to an employer, right? But ultimately the company determines the business value of your certification or you as an individual. What are they willing to pay? Okay, you have to know what you're willing to accept and also look at growth potential. Okay, transition advice one, right? In the job hunt, you are the weapon. Your resume is the bullet. You have to know how well your knowledge, skills, and abilities line up with job requirements. If you have gaps, fill them in. Okay, that's where certs and education and internships come into play. Being a certified professional in any profession and demonstrating you understand the industry and have applied the skills reduces risk for that company. Okay, understand your profession. Okay, number two, no one has experience until you show up. Okay, there's a misnomer. I have to have experience in order to apply for a job. Don't take that crap, okay? Let the company determine if you do or don't have the experience. Okay, even shifting from one civilian company to the next, maybe there's a secret sauce that one company used. And when I go to that other company, it doesn't mean that I'm bringing it with me, right? I had a friend, one of our alumni who's a master black belt in the Air Force got hired by Toyota to do process improvement. The first thing Toyota did was send him through a year of school. Why? Because the Toyota way is the Toyota way. And you have to do it the Toyota way. So even though he was credible, they still sent him back through to relearn how Toyota did it because they didn't honor his experience. Okay. Being able to relate your experience to industry and demonstrate knowledge will help you. Okay. And then skill bridge internships are a great way to get your foot in the door and fill in the experience gaps. But like I said before, being certified beforehand greatly helps. All right, certifications like a well-fitted suit, they both make sure you show up looking like a professional. Okay, I know veterans bring a wealth of capability to the table. Getting that clearly communicated can be really difficult, especially if you don't speak the right language. All right, I often say too, recruiters are the forward observer for the enemy, All right, diving into another topic, but they're given targeting profiles, right? Their hiring manager gives a recruiter critical guidelines to look for. If you do not possess those, they're gonna pass your resume over in about two to six seconds. Okay, you have to know the targeting criteria. You have to know what they're looking for. Otherwise, you're never going to get your foot in the door. All right. Again, we talked about ways to pay for certifications. Okay, don't miss out. If you want to talk through any of these things, let me know. My info is going to be on the last slide. Send me a note, send me an email, give me a call. All right, I'd love to talk with all of you and help you navigate to get to where you want to go. Clearly, if you want project management, I'm a little biased. All right, final takeaway, right? You don't want to be in the firefight trying to upgrade your weapon system, realizing you don't have enough ammo, chow, or water. Okay, build your weapon system early, right? Certifications and your support system, right? Finances and networking so that when you're in the fight, you're simply refining your aim and taking out targets of opportunity, right? There is no reason, at least for the Army, that any soldier should walk into the year of transition not already a professional, not already certified in what you wanted to do. There's a tremendous resource out there. Right. Our passion, again, building high performing teams through project management. Right. We'd love to build on and integrate project management starting at E4 to E5 to E6 so we can make more effective leaders in uniform today and then already set up everybody for opportunities and transition later. So my ask, if you have questions, contact me, reach out, share this with other people, share me with other people so we can help them know how to use their own benefits and be set up for success in the future. All right. Thank you for enduring me for 50 minutes straight of running my suck. Open floor, all right? Thoughts, questions, feedback. How can I help you all get to where you want to be? And Mark, thanks for leaving your camera on. I've seen you scribbling like a madman once in a while and <laughs> trying to absorb. And, uh, you know, I. I think you mentioned in a few weeks you have a PMP application uh, webinar that you're going to be hosting. Is yep. there any 